All right. Let's well, let's kick it off, and sure. uh, people can file in as they want. So, welcome everybody to Net Capital's live Q and A with Chris Lestrino of Kings Crowd. Uh, my name is Rob Burnett. I'm part of the Net Capital team, and I'll be hosting today. Uh, the plan for today is I'm going to ask Chris a, a handful of questions to try and dig into his business and talk about the opportunity that, that's currently live for investment on Net Capital. Uh, I encourage anyone who's attending to put any questions in the Q&A app uh, of Chris, and we'll go back and forth and, and, and you know, dig a little bit further into his business. Uh, you can find more information on netcapital.com uh, and search for King's Crowd. Uh, and so with that, Chris, welcome. Thanks uh, for taking time out of a, a busy day to, to chat with us all. Yeah, no, thanks so much for having me. Really excited to be here. Yeah, that's fantastic. So why don't we kick it off? Um, you know, give us the the, the two-minute overview of King's Crowd. What are you up to? Sure thing. Yeah. So, you know, I always kind of start with the one liner for King's Crowd is really we are becoming that Morningstar independent rating and analytics service for the online private markets. So what does that mean? I know a lot of you, you know, will think of equity crowdfunding. And we're trying to move away from that word for one very specific reason. By that logic, the public markets are equity crowdfunding too, right? It's basically individuals and institutions can all partake in investing in public companies. Um, but 95% of funding in the public markets comes from institutions, 5% comes from individuals. So we recognize that in this market where there are now 50 plus marketplaces from pre-seed opportunities like ourselves, all the way up to pre-IPO companies like Uber and Lyft before they had gone and IPO'd are available for investment from a mix of non-accredited and accredited investors and institutions as well. What's happening is we're having this transformation, which Net Capital is a part of, where we're having these online marketplaces create accessibility to private deals, which were never really accessible or transparent to date. So that's awesome, but it's a really disaggregated market with tons of places where you can go and find deal flow. And frankly, no one has ever really invested in this space except for a very small few individuals in the VC and private equity market. And so what we're bringing to the market is the first kind of institutional grade product where we aggregate the deals from across all 50 marketplaces and then we put them through a vetting and due diligence process and data sets around each one of these companies and follow how those companies perform over time. So you can imagine that over time what we essentially become is almost like a Bloomberg terminal for looking at all of the deals that are out there in the world of the private markets and be able to follow and track all of their ratings and analytics in one spot be able to make informed investment decisions because of that. And we're selling that to both individuals as well as institutions, be it family offices, RIAs, wealth advisors, et cetera. Great, and Chris, you cut out right uh, at the beginning when you were starting to talk about your products, the first two or three sentences. Um, so you might wanna give us just one more overview in case anyone missed it. Yeah, no problem. So essentially, uh, from a product standpoint, we're essentially creating this almost, you know, you could think of it as a, a Bloomberg terminal where every company is aggregated from all 50 marketplaces, has a rating across five key dimensions of the business with structured data around it, um, and basically gets a report card. And so then any institution or individual could go in and say, I want to see every company that's raising at a $50 million valuation or less, that's you know doing a series A or B, um, that's female founded, whatever, whatever criteria matter to them, and then be able to dig into the report and learn more about that organization, but also track all of those companies and understand better what's going on in the entire market. Great. Um, so taking a step back for a second, with every small company, we know that the founding team is really important. So you can take a minute, just kind of introduce yourself and your background as well as the rest of your team. Yeah, absolutely. So essentially my background is I went into management consulting about I guess almost six years ago now, and spent three years in management consulting, largely doing private equity due diligence. Um, and so essentially, I was working on deals where private companies were being transacted by big institutions who were looking to get more diligence on the companies before they made those transactions. So we would spend anywhere from two to four weeks digging into these companies. And I saw this real issue with how the private equity markets ran from an efficiency standpoint. And that was around two key components. It was transparency and access, which I had already mentioned about the product. So on a transparency front, one, it's really hard to find data on the private markets. Two, from a transparency perspective, um, you know, you would watch deals get done that were really not very good, but when the terms don't have to be disclosed and no one actually has to know what's going on because they're not a public company, it's pretty amazing what deals get done. 
uh, while I was there, I'd say 20 of the 30 deals I looked at, I would have never touched myself. Um, they just didn't look great. But at the end of the day, the company wanted to do it anyway. Secondly, from an accessibility standpoint, the thing that bothered me a lot was that when I was looking at these companies, there was two instances where I saw really, really exciting companies that have gone on to be billion dollar plus unicorn companies, saw the opportunity for that to happen, but couldn't invest because I wasn't an accredited investor. And that seemed really wrong to me as well. And so I actually started a FinTech blog, which I ran for about two and a half years for CEOs, tech organizations in the alternative lending and investing sector, including Jason from Net Capital. Um, so I kind of gotten to know all of the, you know, big players in the space from the net capitals to the lending clubs, to the prospers, to the pitch books, all of these people were bringing transparency and access to the private market. Um, worked at a, a travel tech startup for about a year uh, as well. And then John Fanning, who is the founding chairman and CEO of Napster, had seen that article on net capital and basically gave me a call and said, hey, as we're thinking about building this ecosystem and, and seeing the market grow, you know, would you want to come on and build a company? And so he and I teamed up about a year and a half ago to begin the process of building King's Crown. And he's really our first investor and advisor. And then in addition to him, we've also brought, brought on Sean O'Reilly, uh, who's a terrific individual. He comes from the Motley Fool, which many of you may know if you do any public equities research, where he spent a lot of time doing retail and consumer research as well as industrial company research. He also ran their podcast, worked on their marketing, et cetera. And then we just brought on a terrific individual, Olivia, who is a neuroscience major. She worked at an AI uh, VC firm for about a year. Uh, really terrific and is working on the investment analysis side of the business. Uh, and then we have some terrific developers working with us part time. And a big part of raising these funds is to be able to bring some of them on full time uh, once we're kind of ready to go. And the, the last individual I wanted to mention, we also brought on an advisor, uh, Mike Evan, who is the former chief investment officer of Citibank. So a guy who understands the securities markets uh, probably better than anyone. And he kind of recognizes that there's this new trend and that we should be paying attention to it and building the tools around it to enable it to be, you know, an institutional grade market. And that's really exciting to have individuals like him on our team. Great. Sounds like, uh, glad you were able to kind of explain everyone to everyone, the whole team. It sounds like you're putting together a pretty uh, fun group. Um, so circling back to, you know, you discussed, you hit on this a couple of times, but let's dig into the problem a little bit. Talk to me about, sure. you know, in kind of a, in deep, talk to all of us in a little deeper sense, like what's this problem of transparency and access? Where does it come from? And, and what kind of, what are the results of it? Uh, to, you know, to maybe the individual investors who are on this call and to, to kind of everyday Americans. Yeah, absolutely. So from a transparency perspective, essentially until the Jobs Act was created, which is the thing that has enabled regulation crowdfunding, regulation A+, basically this participation of non-millionaires uh, in investing in companies. There were no rules that said that if you're a private company, you have to disclose any information, be it your financials, be it your operating agreements, be it your cap tables, basically all the key essential components of a business uh, that are really important to understand before you invest, you didn't actually have to disclose. Now, private market investors may have asked for it, uh, and you could hand it to them, but you didn't necessarily have to have it audited, things didn't have to be looked at. So shady business can get done, right? In addition to that, when you're trying to decide whether or not to invest in that company, you just have poor data, not only on the company you're looking at, but also on all of their competitors. So if you're looking at the commercial drone industry, you may go in and say, okay, I wanna look at the general commercial drone industry where most of the companies are still private and you can't find any information on them because they're all private companies that aren't disclosing anything. So it creates an inefficiency in trying to learn about the companies and then both make an informed investment decision in the actual specific deal. Now, a couple of good examples of where maybe this transparency uh, has caused issues. Theranos, which I don't know if any of you have watched the, uh, the HBO documentary on Theranos, but basically they had raised, I think, over a billion dollars um, and essentially didn't have a product. You know, they said with one prick of blood, they could basically do a zillion tests and they had all these amazing advisors and smart people. So no one dug into the actual business. And it turned out none of the technology that they were talking about actually worked. Um, which is really, really bad. But because there was no transparency, because they were able to hide behind all these walls, a lot of money was raised and basically it was a, you know, a fire dumpster and, and that all kind of blew up. So in this market, you're required to provide past year's financial data, operating agreements, bad actor checks on founders. There's a whole lot more transparency in these organizations, which is really, really valuable. We've never had a clean data set of startups where we have all of this information plugged in. 
in addition, because the venture industry is so disaggregated and it's all these individual little companies looking at deals on their own, what you have is, is no you know, standardized data set. So what we're doing as part of that transparency effort is we're not only pulling in all of the financial data and the terms data and how much money is being raised and following these companies over time. But in addition to that, we're putting a ratings layer on top of that that's structured and standardized. So for instance, for early stage companies, we look at things like market size, founder experience, terms of the deal, business model, and product and service differentiators. And rather than just say, oh, the founder really reminded me of Mark Zuckerberg, so I'm gonna give him one out of one instead of half out of one or whatever it may be. We actually have three structured scaled questions. So the first one is how many years founding experience do you have? The second is how many years industry experience do you have? And the third is, do you have any exits? Each question is getting question, each rating is getting questions like that that are scaled so that we can look at every company on a standardized base. And then again, over time, you could start to build AI models around that. We've talked to a lot of AI experts on this. Once we get to 1,000, 2,000 companies in our database that we've rated, we can really start to see some of these trends or what are the drivers that are enabling companies to be successful. We even hear VCs wanting to buy our product in the future because essentially outside of Crunchbase and PitchBook, which are good but not great, the only thing they provide is really pricing data on the companies. Uh, they're like, oh my gosh, this would be the, the most powerful and the most dense set of data we've ever had on the private markets because you're creating this finite universe that you're looking at and creating a standardized set of data around it. So that's on the transparency front. And then on the access front, you know, in addition to individuals not having access to good private market deal flow, to be honest, we're getting calls from family offices, registered investment advisors, wealth advisors, um, some brokerage accounts, financial publications. And what they're all saying is, look, we have access to the same ETFs, the same mutual funds, it's boring. We also recognize that one of the highest growing asset classes out there is private companies. And outside of once in a while being able to get into a fund, we don't actually have very good direct access to good deal flow. So what they want from us is to provide a differentiated product for them to be able to go to their investor base with and say, look, we have access to all of this deal flow out there in one place. It's been vetted by this third-party due diligence service. We have all these analytics on them. We're tracking and following these companies. We think we can actually go and invest in the private markets now and provide you a high growth asset class. So they get really excited about that. And then for individuals, it's the same thing. Look, you might not have time to go look at 50 marketplaces, but there are hundreds and hundreds of opportunities at any one time that all of us can invest in. And what we want to do is make that process really simple of finding and investing in those opportunities. So those are kind of the, the two major problems we're solving for. Makes sense. And then kind of you talk about building a data set uh, and, and moving forward, you know, how big is the market for that data set? You've talked about some potential buyers, but let's talk about the, the kind of market you're entering for a second. How big is it? What does it look like? Where, what's the potential here? Sure. So if we look at some of the early stage platforms like WeFunder and Net Capital and Start Engine and Republic, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars have transacted in them under regulation crowdfunding. In addition to that, we also have Regulation A+. Regulation A+, last year in 2018, did about a billion dollars in investment. Then you have Regulation D506C. Now, Regulation D506C only allows accredited investors to partake, but it's still a more transparent process that uh, takes place online. A lot of the raises on that capital were actually side-by-sides to give people a sense of what it looks like. Seed Invest also does a lot of Reg D506C offerings as well, where essentially the deal can still be public, but it's only for accredited you know, millionaire investors. That is doing about four to six billion dollars on a yearly basis. And you could think AngelList and Funders Club, there's just so many portals out there that you almost forget about. And then lastly, there's something called late stage secondaries. Basically, this is just early stage VC firms, early angels, employees, companies that want to basically sell their stock in cool companies, be it a Weaver, be it a, you know, a Lyft before it had IPO'd. Any of these companies that are kind of late stage, have raised a ton of money, have a huge valuation, and people are saying, I want to get some money back for my investments. In that space, we have some major players like SharePost, EquityZen, Forge, uh, so SharePost has done about $4 billion in transactions. It's been around for, I think, five to seven years, but you can imagine it's been growing every year. So they alone are, were probably doing half a billion, a billion last year. So if you look at the entire ecosystem, you're probably looking at around you know, $10 billion in transactions on a yearly basis. Though no one has done a good job of doing that. We'll be the first ones to really size it up. Um, so if you're looking at you know, $10 billion now and growing extremely rapidly, 
if you get to 50, 60, 70 billion dollars, um, you know, you're servicing that volume of investment with our services. So we think, you know, it can easily be within five to seven years, a half a billion, billion dollar plus company. Great. And so the actual product itself, you know, when you produce reports about private companies, et cetera, what data points are you collecting? And then, you know, as, a, as an investor, whether they be a family officer or anyone sitting on this call, as they read your reports, what kind of data am I reading? And, and can you just to unpack that a little bit, what, what kind of things you're looking at and what investors are looking at? Sure. So the first thing I'll say is the product that we have in the market today, I kind of call it the, the hobbyist product, the magazine product. So that was really our first test product that we put on the market to see how people responded to it. And that's how we've become so informed on what it is we need to work towards and build. So what you'll see today is kind of these long form diligence reports where we have really positive ratings, uh, positive ratings, and then negative ratings, um, as well as founder uh, profiles, webinars, educational materials, some analysis of data, et cetera. So that's kind of just to inform you of what's going on in the market and then find the best deals and know which ones to stay away from. What we're moving towards is rating every company under, you know, CF, A+, 506C, late stage secondaries, et cetera. But in the meantime, we still utilize the same criteria. So on a weekly basis, we have a, a tool, we, we acquired a company called Crowdix, which essentially tracks the whole CF market. And then we manually have been tracking the A plus and 506C market and are almost done automating that as well. We pull in all of those deals on a weekly basis. And then we sit down the three team members and we have a long discussion. It's usually a couple of hours and we'll go through each one of the new opportunities that's available for investment. I mentioned to you around market size, founder experience, terms of the deal, business model, product and service differentiators. In addition to that, we'll look at their form C, which has their financials, past year's financial information. Uh, we'll look at the operating agreements, we'll read through it. We'll just try and get a sense of, you know, are there any red flags? Is this a company that's intriguing and at least hits on a few of the buckets in a positive way, um, or does it not? And so once we kind of get to at least a, we feel neutral to positive about this business, we hand it off to one of our five um, analysts, outsource analysts that are freelancers that work for us. Some are ex-VCs, some are ex-consultants. Um, so we're trying to get into the VC game, all, you know, agree and smart equity researchers. We'll hand it off to them, asking them again to look at those same five key components. They dig into each one of the companies, look at all of that data that they can find, come back to us with their analysis, we'll have discussion with them, go through an editing process, um, and then kind of come up with a decision. Do we feel really positively about it? Does it hit on all of our criteria? Is it missing some things? Does it have a certain level of risk that concerns us? Um, and then based on that analysis, we'll kind of go through the finalizing process and provide that long form report to investors. So it's a very uh, thorough uh, process and it takes us a long time. But I think what we end up coming out with is a, a product where you have all of the information you need to make an investment decision. And I always say, you may or may not agree with us, and that's okay. What we're providing you is a methodology and way to think about each one of these investments. And we've already gone through and done a lot of the hard work of picking apart you know, what's actually true from the offering page, what's not true, and giving you an independent review of that company. And again, you might decide, well, I don't invest in pharma because it's really risky. That's okay. But we at least want to set you up to understand how to think about investing in pharma. Great. And kind of just to kind of wrap a bow on that, you know, as people are starting to look at deals, you do you have recommendations of two or three things, two or three data points, whether it's in a King's Crowd review or not, that, that uh, investors should look at when they look at private deals? Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, one of the big things we always look at is the, the founder um, and the founding team and the investor, the early investors they have, et cetera. It really is a Okay, they might have, anyone can have a good idea. It's easy to have a good idea. It's all about execution. Um, so finding experienced founders is always a really powerful thing. People have been through it. Um, so one of the companies that I'm looking at right now that I love, which is on Seed Invest, another platform, now RX, I mean, the company is just absolutely crushing it. And it's because they've worked together on several teams, they've built companies, they've sold companies, they really know what they're doing. So that's always exciting because you know that it's not just, yes, these guys actually have the ability to do really special things. So experience of the founding team, I think is always great. And I always say, look, that's even a knock against us is like, we're not as experienced, but we surrounded ourselves with really experienced founders and investors and entrepreneurs to help us kind of fulfill those gaps. 
Um, so that's one big thing. The other thing is, are they solving a really big problem? So, you know, if you're solving the, you know, there, there was a company we looked at many, many months ago, and it's basically a candle company. There's nothing differentiated about it. And they were trying to service a regional market in Texas. There's just like, there was more issues than I, I can even say about the business. But at the end of the day, they weren't solving a big problem. It was a really small problem, in fact. And there was nothing really unique or differentiated about it. Um, and that would be the last thing that I would say is really important. What makes this product special, different, or service product special or different or whatever that sets it so far apart from everything else? If you looked at Uber 10 years ago, you might have said, well, the market's pretty big. Taxis are pretty big. But this is just so unique and so much better. If you ever tried to hail a taxi or if you lived in the suburbs or were trying to get into the city with a taxi, it was nearly impossible. You'd have to call like two days out and make sure that someone could come and pick you up. And now these guys are saying within seconds, they could find you a driver and have you wherever you need to be in no time utilizing your phone. That's like a really big disruptable idea because it was so different from anything else out there on the market. Now, if someone sat down with you today and said the exact same thing, hey, the ride sharing market is massive and we're going to cut off this one little sliver. That's great, but it's never going to be quite the extraordinary success that an Uber was because it's not so differentiated, right? They're just kind of being a me too product of everything else that's already out there. So look for something really unique in a big market opportunity or that can become a big market opportunity with an experienced team that you think can actually execute on that opportunity. Great. Uh, and so talk to me a little bit about the, you, we've touched on it in different points throughout the webinar, but talk to me a little bit about the business model for King's Crowd. How are you guys making money? If someone invests in you, how do we know that King's Crowd is going to generate revenue, survive and grow? Sure. So uh, essentially we have a subscription SaaS type business. Um, so for individuals, you know, right now the product is 10 and 20 bucks a month. Um, once we launch our full rating platform that I was discussing, it'll probably be somewhere in the range of you know, 50 to $60 per month per user. Um, and that's kind of for that more institutional grade product. Now, the real opportunities to scale this business and where we get really excited is with institutions. So for instance, we have one family office that's already agreed and said they want our product. Um, they ha they're a multifamily office with about 100 families. It's $1,000 per family per year. That's about a $100,000 account. Uh, and essentially, you know, a SaaS subscription where they have access to the platform, they can track all the investments, and in addition, provide that to all of their families and say, hey, you could come in, look at the terminal, tell me what companies you're interested in. Um, RIAs and wealth advisors will be somewhere around $2,500 a year for a licensing uh, fee, basically a SaaS fee. Um, and then lastly, the way to scale our business is to license our rating product to other financial organizations. Um, so we're partnering with self-directed IRAs, we're partnering with a couple of financial publications, um, and we're partnering with some early stage banks that are being forward thinking about wanting to provide private market solutions to their customers. Um, we have an immediate opportunity to get to almost a half a million people licensing our top level ratings where individuals be able to go to whatever platform may be, an IRA, a financial publication, wherever it is, our licensing partners that we're working with, and basically see all of the companies under Reg CF or A plus, whatever, with a couple key data points and the top level rating from King's Crowd. Kind of like Morningstar you used to find in your brokerage account, uh, where you might be able to find the report or S&P or whichever report you care about. Um, we're going to be the same thing. So you'll be able to find the top level report, but then if you actually want to dig in and get all of the information, you could pay, you know, 50 bucks and have a revenue share agreement where we split that for them to be able to go in and actually read the full report. And so that's our way to kind of scale to millions of users uh, and also, you know, grow our revenues by charging, you know, a dollar per head per user per year type of thing. Very cool. Um, Great. So I'm coming into the last couple of questions I have prepared for Chris. So anyone who, any of the attendees, potential investors who have any questions, just a reminder to, to throw a question in the Q and A box and, uh, you know, happy to ask that of Chris. Um, while we're waiting, Chris, you know, talk about your next major milestones. You know, where does this fundraise get you, get you and what are the kind of next progressions you'd like to see King's Crowd make? Yeah, so basically the immediate next mile. So, you know, we're at about 100K raise. We're trying to get to 250, which will enable us to bring on a full stack developer and a director of investments. So essentially, we're about 60% through the product development to get our, our ratings platform out uh, and in the hands of customers. So we want to finish that product within the next six months and roll it out with that, you know, first family office. There's also a second one who's kind of given us a verbal yes that we'd love to roll out with as well. There's a few RAs and wealth advisors who've already said they want to be our beta users. 
and we have a licensing partner waiting to integrate with our, our ratings platform. So we basically need to be able to execute on those immediate addressable opportunities in front of us, which gets us to a point where you know, we're generating $250,000, $500,000 just off of those immediate opportunities. Uh, and then the next step after that is to take it to the next level and say, okay, now we need to start to build out our sales funnel. Um, you know, it's all been inbound interest to date. So the next step is to go and do outbound, um, you know, uh, business development with family offices, REAs, wealth advisors, et cetera. So that's, that's the immediate next step. Finish the product, get it to market and in the hands of our users who have already said they want the product and then begin to build out that sales funnel. Great. Um, and then, you know, as you look into the future, do you, what year, do you see either potential partnerships with King's Crowd, potential, you know, exit opportunities without getting too speculative, kind of where do you see King's Crowd ending up in five years or 10 years? Sure. So, yeah, I mean, you, you can't, you, you know, we can't predict anything that'll happen. Things change every day. So I won't say at all that we know what's going to happen. Um, what would be, you know, a likely scenario that I would work towards? If I think about it, I look at a pitch book, which basically is providing offline uh, deal analytics, and we're acquired by Morningstar for $225 million. Now, as the world moves online, and we begin to service that, and we add on this ratings layer, which has never really been possible because of the disaggregated nature of the market, I could imagine that a player like a Morningstar, or a Barron's, or an S&P would come, you know, kind of sniffing around and saying, wait a minute, maybe we need an add-on product that better services the private markets in order to grow it. So I could see that being the avenue uh, of exit. And again, my whole idea would be able to get to a place where we're servicing hundreds of family offices, wealth advisors, registered investment advisors. We have four or five licensing partners that represent millions of individuals, um, you know, and we're getting into our first or second or third set of brokerage accounts where we're literally offering private market investment opportunities in more traditional brokerage accounts and we're the ratings provider within that. Um, at that point, you know, I think there's an opportunity to build diversified investment funds off of our data, um, to start selling that data for others to create ETF type products for the private markets. Um, and that really puts us in a position to be a very attractive acquisition candidate, um, you know, to one of these larger organizations who's looking to diversify into the private space. Great. Um, we've got a couple of questions from, from the crowd here. Um, sure. One that seems most relevant, and we can, I think we can clarify, both of us can clarify this. <laughs> Frederick, the question is, are you asking investors to invest in a particular company? So I'll start by saying that, thanks for the question, Fred. Uh, this webinar, uh, you know, King's Crowd as a company is available for investment on net capital. So anyone who's interested in, in investing in King's Crowd as a company can go to netcapital.com and find the King's Crowd deal and click invest. Um, it's open to everybody. Uh, but then, Chris, you can speak to whether or not, A, people should invest in your deal, but also do you, as King's Crowd, ever ask people or recommend people invest in other deals? Yeah, absolutely. So our whole thing is, you know, we're not even making a recommendation. We're providing a rating to help you make a decision. We look for our key criteria. We have our methodology. We think through whether or not we think the investment is, a, is, is viable, uh, makes sense for investors. And we provide you that rating so that you have the informed investment decision information you need to go and decide whether or not you want to invest. We're not telling you to invest. We're not recommending you invest. We're literally saying, look, if you're looking for deal flow and you're trying to find the pockets where there might be opportunity, we've gone through and done the hard work and we spent the time and we've aggregated the deals and we've worked through all the deals. And here's where we're coming out. Agree or disagree, you now have this independent information to decide whether or not you want to invest. So I would say, not recommending, we're just trying to provide a resource for you to make an informed decision. Um, the other thing that I would say is in terms of us, we never rate ourselves. We don't think that would be an independent and un unbiased analysis, which is what we try and do on every company. Um, so I'm not recommending you invest in us. I'm telling you with this information that we've provided today, with everything else that you've been able to gather on your own and, and through the diligence work you might've done, invest if you think it fits your portfolio, if it fits you know, even your interests, um, and make a level of investment that makes sense for your portfolio. If you have two grand to invest this year, don't put the two grand into us, put a hundred into us and put a hundred into 19 other deals and get to a diversified portfolio or whatever you decide makes sense. Great, and just so everyone knows, um, there was a question of where they can go to invest. So it's netcapital.com slash companies slash Kings Crowd. 
I put that link in the chat box uh, here on the webinar. It should also be in the invite when you signed up. Uh, and uh, if anyone um, can't find it, uh, feel free to just go to netcapital.com and search for King's Crowd. Uh, you should be able to find it. Awesome. And so another question, um, we had a question from uh, a attendee about you know what what factors if you're a founder can play into how best you know how best can I put my company together to make a King's Crowd rating look favorable? <laughs> uh, so how do how what what kind of things should they watch out for? And what kind of things could make it so the King's Crowd thinks that their, their round will sell out or they'll raise as much as they want? Yeah, so, I mean, there's there's so many factors that go into that second part. For the first part, you know, end of the day, it comes to you have to tell a good story, but the story has to be real too. And, and it, the, the product has to be real. So, you know, if you have a good idea, that's great, but it takes a lot more than that. You have to start to assemble the right people around you. You have to put the right terms on the deal and do your research around what type of valuation would make sense. You have to go and think about your market and, and truly think about who your competitors are and how you're different and why you're going to be valuable. Um, you have to think through all the components of your story. And what I would say is understand yourself in the context of everyone else around you. So, you know, if you think, oh, I'm gonna go out with just an idea in a market like, you know, I hate to hit on it, like Lyft or Uber in the ride sharing space, and you just have this idea, that's gonna be a really hard sell. If you come to the market and you already have a whole bunch of traction because you have this slightly different angle, um, that's great. But it needs to make sense for the market you're going into. You need to have the right team with the right experience. You need to put the right people around you. Um, it needs to become compelling because you hit on those key components. But it's hard for me to say, how do you make it attractive? Because I think end of the day, if your story, you know, we're going to rate it across the five key dimensions of the business that we care about um, and that we think are really important that every VC looks at. I can't say whether or not you can make your story more attractive. I don't think you can. I think end of the day, it's that you take the right steps to build the business and you don't try and be too aspirational or non-aspirational. You do what makes sense for that business and that. I wish I had a better answer for that. And in addition to the, you know, how do you know if the company's going to sell out or not? Um, we're actually going to work on a product for founders just to help them before they go live. We actually track all this data by industry, um, you know, by stage of company, et cetera. So we'll be able to tell you eventually, um, you know, hey, put in your revenues, put in your industry, and then we'll be able to tell you basically what the typical valuation, how much money a company raises. Um, but again, it's amazing. You, you just never know what company is going to sell out. And it really does come back to the founder making the moves to make sure they sell out that round. And on that note about selling out, you know, you're, you guys have raised close to $100,000 so far on net capital. You've talked about a target of $250,000, but your round is open for a full million dollars. Um, do you want to kind of explain why that is to, to the investors here on the call and talk about you know, what it means to sell out a round versus just raise a, a, a significant amount of capital? Yeah, sure. So you know, one of the things that I've kind of learned in this process is that being aspirational in terms of how much money you can raise is okay. And basically for me, what it comes down to, there's a necessary amount of capital we need to raise, which is 250 to really execute on our near term goals. That's like where we want to be will put us in a good place as a business, et cetera. Now the up to a million is basically, look, if there are people who want to partake and be involved with us and be a part of this project from, you know, the early days, we want them involved. We found, you know, we raised about uh, almost 200,000 between two other raises prior to this on Net Capital and Start Engine, which was awesome. And we have so many people who have, I, the other day, I, I hope Alex Medic, he, he's an amazing individual. He'd be okay with me sharing his name. Um, he's one of our investors, you know, put in some money and he's been so helpful. He's donated Facebook ads to us. He's worked with us on our marketing because he's basically a chief marketing officer of another company. Um, he sent us stickers the other day of like the King's Crowd logo that we could send to our investors. We had so many amazing people just like him get involved with King's Crowd. And so we want to leave room for a lot of people to partake. And if they want to be involved at this point, we're okay with that. If they don't, that's fine too. We get to 250, we're going to be very, very happy. Even at the 100, that's terrific. That, that really is going to help us meet and get to our goals. Um, so, you know, the, the selling out thing, there are different ways to do it. You could just set a low minimum 
you know, you could set you're only trying to raise 100, 200 K and sell out. That's awesome. It's a really good story. It definitely has one good punchline, which is we sold out around. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think the most important thing is you're raising the capital you need to continue to grow the business. And if you're doing that, then you've set the right amount. And if you want to, you know, put an aspirational amount, a million bucks, whatever it may be, that's great. As long as you have the idea of, look, I don't necessarily need that, but it's there so that I can have more and more people partake if they want to. Great. So we've got one comment and one more question. Uh, if anyone else attending has any questions, put them in now. Otherwise, we'll come close to wrapping up. Um, the comment is from Frederick. Uh, he says, this is a great webinar. Thank you so much, Chris. And I'm going to invest. So you know, thanks, Frederick. That's Terrific. a great comment. We appreciate it. Um, and then the last question I have so far, unless anyone sneaks one in, is uh, from James. Uh, can you scale the opportunity for investors to use your service to find, evaluate, and make investments in private companies? What do you see investor acceptance is of the, uh, what do you see the investor acceptance is of this new way of investing in private companies? Yeah. So, in terms of the scaling component, I think the simple answer is yes, because there are so many avenues to sell this product. Um, so again, this is one of those markets where I actually think we're one of the key components to growing the market. So like I said, we put our product out in the market a year ago, a very, very MVP type product. I mean, it was really bad to start, but we at least put it out there and the content was good. The website wasn't necessarily great. Um, and then we had all of these learnings and we, we ran really lean for the first year, but we had an incredible amount of learnings and better than the learnings was just the inbound interest. And again, that's going to the institutions, that's going to people who want to license our data. I mean, it's been absolutely astounding to me how much interest there is from the broader ecosystem of investors. So to scale the business, you know, we license with a couple of these partners, we'll already be accessing hundreds of thousands of users. And then we'll be accessing super high-end clients that drive really high revenues and good margins for us via the family offices and the RIAs and the wealth advisors. So scaling the business absolutely is, is possible. And I think we're, we're well on track to be able to do that. Um, and then, I'm sorry, I'm trying to remember the, the second part of the question. Um, what do you see as investor acceptance of this new way uh, of investing in private companies? So are investors okay investing this new way online? Sure. So yeah, great question. And again, that kind of goes back to this whole year long exercise of learning about the market. And what we've heard is people are really interested they're a little skeptical and they need more information and help. And it's the information and help that's gonna get them to invest. So we already have a very active cohort of 5,500 subscribers. I believe it says 3,000 on the offering, but uh, we, we've grown since, since we, we launched to about 5,500 subscribers, individuals. 70% of them are 35 to 55 year old individuals making 100 to $250,000 on a yearly basis who have on average made 17 investments in this market to date and are looking to do about 10 investments yearly. So this is a very active cohort of investors that are really excited. And we kind of call them the new angel. They're, they're almost you know accredited investor. They're making good money and they want to partake in this market. So there's a lot of excitement from that cohort who see incredible, viable, exciting deals to invest in. And in addition to them, like I said, all these other institutions are now poking around and saying, how do we get involved? We want to be investing in this stuff. So I would say there is a, a lot of openness and excitement. Uh, now we need to provide the tools to enable them to do so in a better way. Great. Well, there's no open questions. Uh, someone might be able to sneak one here in here at the end, but uh, thanks for joining us, Chris. Are there any kind of parting thoughts you'd like to leave uh, this group of uh, attendees with? Uh -oh. I, I think the only thing, you know, that I like to call out is where we are today from a product standpoint, where the market is today from a market standpoint, we're in the first innings when you think about what this becomes, you know, in 10 years, I imagine that most VCs, most private equity shops, most family offices, everyone is going to be investing in a mix of private and public companies. And they're going to be utilizing online tools to do so. And we're gonna be one of those key tools. I mean, to think that the venture market will continue as an offline business where people are finding deals only within their network, 97% is going to white males in three key cities. It's just not a world that I think we live in in the future. Not because it's not democratized, it's just we now have the regulations that enable more transparency and access and we have the technology and tools to enable online investing. And so with that, every industry except venture capital date, literally healthcare, financial services, whatever, has been disrupted by technology. 
the actual investing sector of venture and private equity is now being disrupted, but we're just in the first, first days. What this looks like in the future will be a pseudo public market that is way more accessible, way more liquid, way more efficient. And that's what we're working towards. And we think we're providing a tool and coming in as kind of a first market mover and what's going to be a really uh, incredible and exciting space to be in. Great, and I hate to, to not let you leave it at that, but we had one more question roll in. So sure. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have you answer that. Um, the question is, is due diligence on companies strictly, strictly desktop based? or is it a deep dive roll up the sleeves at the company, uh, at the company in question? Uh, and then as a second question is, do issuing companies pay you to be rated? Great question. Uh, first off, we are never ever paid by the organizations to provide the rating. Uh, when you're on the platform, we make that independent analysis. We're not getting paid by the companies on purpose or the platforms. The whole idea is that we're independent on bias. So no, we don't get paid by the companies. Um, in terms of, um, the, the diligence. So we do a bunch of desktop research and to be clear, uh, when I worked at this, you know, uh, consulting shop where we did all of this private equity diligence, you know, I would say about 70% of it, no matter what is going to be desktop based, whether it's digging into their financials, whether it's digging into the terms, whether it's digging into the market, doing that actual research. But if we're going to rate a company positively, 80% plus of the time, we will make sure that we get on the phone. Now, if they're an incredibly experienced founder, they're really hard to get a hold of, yada, 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 we may or may not be able to. But the vast majority of the time, we do actually get on the phone with these founders and have a discussion with them and dig in with them. And then we'll typically send more follow-up questions to them. And we'll typically even try and point those questions at other members in the organization to have to answer as well. So we get to know more about the management team. And then the other thing that we do is if it is in a specialized sector that does take uh, you know, a higher form of, of information that maybe we just don't have in-house. The, uh, you know, the easiest one to talk about is pharmaceuticals. Now, I have some background in that from my private equity diligence work, um, but we actually have some people in our network we'll call on and say, hey, can you dig into this company? Tell me your thoughts. I've had people um, who work in the pharma industry send me literal pipelines of other competitors that are out there, provide me the tools that we need to think about it in a more informed way. So in addition to kind of talking to the company, in addition to reaching out to those, you know, investors, we also do our desktop research. So I'd say it's relatively comprehensive, um, you know, and if we have clients, especially family offices that said they want, you know, even a little bit more, um, you know, we can definitely roll up our sleeves and dig in further. Great. Well, uh, thanks again, Chris, for, for being Thank here. You. I think that's all the questions we've got today. Um, if anyone has any additional questions or questions about particularly how to invest in King's Crowd or anything about the net capital platform, you can reach out directly to me. My email is rob.burnett at netcapital.com. I've included it uh, in the chat box, uh, chat box uh, below. Uh, it also should be in the invite you use to sign up for this. We will be uh, packaging this webinar and putting it online. So if anyone wants to rewatch, really dig into Chris's answers, they can do it there. Uh, and then we encourage you to sign up for the next webinars as they come, you know, be a part of Net Capital. Um, and as Chris said, if it fits in your portfolio and you'd like to, um, you're welcome to come to Net Capital and invest in King's Crowd. Uh, Terrific. So appreciate you being here. Yeah, and thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Have a great one. Thanks everyone for attending. Take care, everyone. Thank you, guys.